Aloha, everyone. Pat Zuccaran here with Evidence and Answers, and it's great to be with all of you again. And we're talking about a great topic today, heaven, our eternal home. You know, there's a lot of interest in heaven. A recent Pew Research poll shows that despite our secular society, nearly 70% of Americans believe in a heaven. And as you can see from the books that are out there and the movies that are being written, there is a tremendous amount of interest in heaven. So we're going to talk about a lot of topics today. We're going to cover a whole lot. And I don't expect you to get it all. You can go to our website at evidenceandanswers.org and listen to several of our talks on this topic of heaven. But we're going to go pretty quickly. I'm going to be quoting a lot of scripture at you because the Bible gives us the most accurate and true description of heaven over, you know, any other literature or testimony that is out there about people who claim to have gone to heaven or books that are written supposedly about people who visited heaven. The Bible gives us the true and most accurate picture. So I'll be quoting a lot of scriptures for you today, and we'll be going over a lot of material because each one of these points in my theology class is actually a whole lecture in it of itself. And so we're trying to, I'm trying to boil it all down to within about a 40 minute talk here. Okay. So I hope you can review it at evidenceandanswers.org, or perhaps you can get a hold of this video and review it as well. Let me go to my share screen here so that you can see, I can share with you the PowerPoint as we go through our topic here. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of best-selling books out there about people who died and supposedly went to heaven or even went to hell. And most of them, you know, they are questionable. I've read through a whole lot of them. And uh, a lot of them call me and ask me if I'll endorse their book or that they're coming to town, if I'll come to their conference and give them a radio interview and I've had to decline them all because there are a lot of discrepancies and facts in there that are contrary to what the Bible teaches. But why this great interest in heaven? Well, I believe Ecclesiastes 3.11, God states that he has set eternity in the hearts of men and women, that all of us were created in the image of God. And so we innately know that God exists, and that we are eternal beings, and that there's more than just this life on this earth. There's something more. There's life beyond the grave. And if you reason it out, if God does not exist, if this life is all that there is, our earthly existence is essentially meaningless. I mean, we exist just for a brief moment in time, and then we're extinct forever and ever and ever. And eventually, as the universe expands and runs out of energy, it's going to reach a state called final entropy, where the universe comes to an end. So everything comes <clears throat> without God's intervention. Everything comes to an end in extinction and annihilation. So what difference did it ever make that we were ever here? If everything <laughs> ends in death and annihilation, I mean, what a grim you know, outlook for those who do not believe in God and eternal life. Fortunately, the evidence is very compelling, overwhelming, I think, that God exists and that there is indeed eternal life demonstrated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, of which we have compelling evidence that Christ is who he said he was, accomplished what he said he would, prophesied, and accomplished his own resurrection for the dead, proving he is indeed God uh, in the flesh, the source of life, and the giver of everlasting and eternal life. Now, as we begin to talk about heaven, there are a lot of misconceptions about heaven. Here are, here are a couple uh, cartoons I like. There's one from the far side. It says, welcome to heaven. Here's your harp. Then the bottom says, welcome to hell. Here's your accordion. You know, I mistakenly 
share this at a church and the accordion organization of that city was there in the audience. So you could tell I really got it after this uh, cartoon. Here's another one from the Daily Tune. You have people there in heaven and another group there partying. It says, somehow I thought it may be different up here. So there's a lot of misconceptions about heaven. So it's important that Christians, we have the right understanding of heaven. Now, why is it important that we have a right understanding of heaven? Well, first of all, heaven, for all believers in Jesus Christ, heaven is our true home. This is our citizenship. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So our eternal body will be similar, will have some facets that are similar to the resurrection body of Jesus Christ. So we'll have a glorified body, but our citizenship ultimately is in heaven. In other words, you know, if you think about it, we're going to spend more time on the other side of eternity's door than here upon this earth. We're going to be on this earth for, if we're lucky, 80 years or more. But then the time of eternity, we're going to spend a whole lot more time on the other side of eternity's door than here upon this earth. So heaven is our true home. Second, the Bible states that because heaven is our true home, we're just strangers in this land. We're simply passing through. Hebrews 11 talks about the great um, saints of the past. And it says, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles while here on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And so uh, the great saints of old were looking for, they understood they're just strangers passing through and that their eternal home was the heavenly city God had prepared for them. And finally, 1 John states that this world is temporary. You know, this world is passing away. And so, therefore, we're not a part of this temporary world. That's why John says, do not love the world or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride and possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. And so this world is temporary, it's passing away. Why do you want to invest your life in the things of this world that are coming to an end? Fourth, understanding heaven helps us to endure, not to escape, but to endure the trials of this earth. We can make it through life on this earth with all its difficulties and hardships, facing them with hope and with joy when we have a clear understanding of heaven and our eternal hope, a hope that can never be destroyed, never taken away, a hope that is everlasting. When you have a true understanding of our heavenly hope, it helps you endure and persevere with joy, not with defeat or sorrow through our difficult times here upon this earth, because ultimately we're gonna be in glory together, forever victorious with Christ. What greater hope can you have than that? And as Psalm 90, 10 through 12 states, it, the psalmist writes, is, teach us to number our days accordingly that we may live in wisdom, understanding that our life here is temporary and that our true home is eternity with God. It teaches us how to live in accordance with wisdom. And basically to sum it up, you know, there's three things that last for all eternity, all right? God, his word, and the souls of men and women. Those are the three things that last forever. Your job title will not last forever. Your house, your stock portfolio, 
the achievements you make. You, your descendants, your children, your grandchildren. I mean, they're not going to last forever. Three things last for eternity. God, his word, and the souls of men and women. And so a wise person invests in the things that will matter for eternity. Whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, a mechanic, a school teacher, a soldier, a government official, whatever you may be, whatever we're doing, God has called us to, we're investing in the things that matter for eternity. So those are some of the reasons why we need to have a good understanding of heaven, our true citizenship. Now, there's a lot of distorted pictures of what heaven is like out there from literature and the media. Much of our understanding of heaven, especially, you know, for me, before I became a Christian, was shaped by the literature and the media out there. Here's a... Um, I had a movie. Whoops. Okay. I guess it'll be coming later. So because there's so many distorted pictures of what's there in heaven, we need to have a good, clear understanding of, it, you know, how the Bible describes heaven. So our study of heaven first begins with the citizens of heaven. Who will be in heaven? And of course, first and foremost, heaven is where God abides. He is the centerpiece of heaven. Right, We all know that God is omnipresent and he's everywhere. He's just not in heaven and not anywhere else. He's everywhere. But he's manifested in a very special way there in heaven. It is there the Bible describes that he sits upon his throne and Christ is seated at his right hand. The throne of God is the centerpiece of heaven. The prophets and the apostles who actually went to heaven the first thing that they saw was the throne of God. That was the centerpiece of heaven. You know, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. You know, the first thing Isaiah saw in heaven was the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphs with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces, and two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying and they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. Revelation 4 describes the throne of God. This is the magnificent centerpiece of heaven. All right. John says that once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. They were the seven spirits of God, and also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. You know, in Revelation, it mentions the throne of God nearly 39 times, all right? You cannot escape heaven and not, you know, you can't go to heaven and not see the throne of God. It is the centerpiece of heaven. And all the activity focuses in the direction of the throne and all the glory emanates from the throne of heaven. And it's a magnificent sight. John describes it a little bit, how a rainbow encircled the throne. And for those of us who've been to Hawaii and those of us who live here, we get to see a rainbow every day. And rainbows are absolutely magnificent. There are here some shots of the magnificent rainbows of Hawaii. And the, the, the closest thing John could describe, the glory of the heavenly throne was uh, the precious stones that we have here upon this earth. He mentions them in the book of Revelation. Jasper, carnelian, onyx, emerald, chrysolite, sapphire. So heaven is a place in the very presence of God. And since God is central there, unbelievers will not want to be there. You know, if you don't want to be with God now, 
you won't want to be with God forever and eternity. That would not be heaven for you. That would be hell for you for all eternity. So those who don't want God now, he allows them to be separated from him forever. He won't force you to be with him forever. I remember, you know, in Dallas, I had a friend uh, whose company was a big supporter of President Bush. And uh, when he retired from his presidency, they threw a great banquet from him. And at the hotel, it was a five-star hotel. It was best hotel, best music, best food, uh, you know, the uh, best entertainment, the best of everything was there, just a grand ballroom. And my friend went there. And of course, everything is about George Bush Jr., right? President Bush as he's retiring, his accomplishments, his pictures, his awards, you know, all the things that he accomplished as a president. Now, my friend absolutely hated George Bush, but he had to go because his company was sponsored, you know, one of the big supporters of George Bush Jr. But he hated George Bush, all right? So he went there to this great banquet, the best of everything. And do you think he was having a great time? Absolutely not. He was in hell because he hated George Bush. The banquet, though it had the best of everything, it was hell for him because he hated George Bush. So those who don't want to be with God now won't be forced to be with God forever. He allows you to be separate from him forever in a place called hell, right? Now, God is the centerpiece of heaven and the throne of God, therefore, is the centerpiece of heaven, right? There is, you know, there was a movie out there, What Dreams May Come. You may remember it. Well, Robin Williams died and, you know, he went to heaven. And when they get to heaven, it's the pristine paradise that, you know, Robin Williams had dreamed of. And they get to this one scene where Robin Williams asks Cuba Gooding uh, Jr., you know, where's God in all this? All right. So this is about a one minute clip. Let's take a look at this clip here. All right. Well, you see that clip there where Robin William is in heaven and he asks Cuba Gooding, where's God in all this? And Cuba Gooding goes, well, he's out there somewhere, well, somewhere out there telling us that he loves us. Well, that's not what heaven's going to be like. You, you're not going to be wondering where is God in all this? He is the centerpiece of heaven. All right. The throne of God is the centerpiece of heaven. You can't go to heaven and miss the throne of God. That's why there's several books out there about people who died and went to heaven. And the interesting thing is they never mentioned the throne of God. Yet all the prophets and the apostles who had a glimpse of heaven, that's the first thing and pretty much uh, takes up most of their writing when they're describing heaven is the throne of God. You know, I remember the book 90 Minutes in Heaven where Don Piper died and went to heaven for 90 minutes. And in 90 minutes, he never saw the throne of God. You know, and there are other questionable things out there in the book, but that's one of the most, you know, questionable parts of, the, of his entire testimony I had. I've heard him speak. I've read his book. I've read the critiques. That's one of the most 
you know, parts that I really question. Because you can't go to heaven and escape the throne of God. And he was there for 90 minutes and he never saw the throne of God. Very interesting. That's why I had trouble, you know, really endorsing uh, his conference when he came here to Hawaii. And many other speakers who supposedly died and went to heaven, they don't mention the throne of God. But that's the centerpiece of heaven, right? You can't miss that when you get to heaven. So God will be there. Second, there will be the angels of God. And book of Revelation says that there are thousands upon thousands of the angels of God in heaven. Revelation 5 says that I look and heard a voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000s. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. It must really be something to see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of angels singing, worthy is the lamb. It just must be absolutely incredible. You know, when I'm in a concert hall and I hear a magnificent choir of two, three hundred singing worthy is the lamb or Handel's Messiah. It's really something, but to be in, you know, the heavenly realm with thousands of them singing, it must, it must really just be something spectacular. So we'll be there with the heavenly angels, and then we'll be there with the redeemed of all the ages. Revelation chapter seven, Verse 9 says, after I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hand. You know, just on a quick side note, from this passage and others, I don't think everybody in heaven is going to be blonde hair and blue eyed like you see in a lot of pictures. I think your distinctive features will still be there. Asians will be Asians, Blacks will be Blacks, Hispanics will be Hispanics, Whites will be Whites. Why do I get that from? Well, <clears throat> you know, in this passage, John could identify that they were from every nation, tribe, and language. Their distinctive ethnic features were still there with them. That's how he could identify that they're from all different parts of the world. But we'll be with the redeemed from all the ages. Hebrews 12, 22 says, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. So men and women are made fully perfect in their glorified state. Now in heaven, Jesus and Paul talks about us being complete in our perfection. We complete in our physical perfection. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about our heavenly bodies, that we're going to put away these old decaying bodies and take on the new heavenly glorified eternal body. So we'll have physical perfection. We'll have perfection in knowledge that our knowledge will be complete. We won't know everything as God knows it. But we, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, says we see through a mirror dimly now, then we shall see fully. We know in part, but then we shall know fully. All right, so our knowledge will be made complete. And we will be morally perfect. It's a place of moral perfection where our sin nature is gone. The battle against our old sin nature, lust, greed, envy, jealousy, that old man that we've been battling, that battle Paul talks about in Romans 5 through 7 against the old man is done, all right? And we are full, fully morally perfect, never struggling again with those kinds of sinful desires. You know, spending eternity with sinful people would not be paradise. You know, some of my best friends here, you know, after two, three days together on a trip, we kind of get on each other's nerves, you know, no matter how great our friendships 
We are. And to be in heaven with sinful people, that wouldn't be heaven at all. Our sin nature must be completely done away with, completely eradicated. And that's only possible by the atoning work of Christ and the renewing work of the Holy Spirit. And so when we are complete in our perfection, our relationships then are going to be in perfect harmony as well. No more envy and jealousy and anger and grudges or any of those kinds of disputes between any of us. Now, if there's one word that I could use to describe heaven, it would be glory. So we're going to take a brief glimpse at the glory of heaven. We talked about the citizens of heaven. Now let's talk a little bit of the glory of heaven. And one of the most glorious things about heaven is we get to see God in his fullness. This is a theological term we call the beatific vision, something that every believer in Christ is looking forward to, seeing God fully in his glory face to face. John 1.18 states that fallen sinful man cannot see God fully in his glory, but eternal, uh, the immortal man, fully perfected in our glorified body, then we shall see God fully. Revelation 22 verse 4 says that they, the saints, will see his face and his name will be upon their foreheads. 1 John chapter 3 verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. You know, John writes that in our fully glorified state, we're going to be like Christ. And what was Christ like in his full glorified state? Well, after his resurrection, we saw that he ate, right? That he had a, a new kind of glory. He was immortal. He could travel very quickly. He was in the prime of his life. That's how we're going to be. You know, a lady asked me in class one time, she said, how old will we be in heaven? And I said, well, if 1 John 3, 2 says we'll be like him, we'll be in the prime of life. And, you know, so we're not going to be, you know, if you were aborted, you're not going to be an embryo forever in heaven. You're not going to be a six-year-old child forever in heaven. We're all going to be in our prime state. And she kind of pressed me. She said, how old is that? I said, well, I don't know, because in heaven, you know, we're eternal. But I would say maybe, you know, 30, 31, 32, somewhere around there. And she screamed, no, you know, and I said, well, what's wrong? She said, I was pregnant. From 30 to 32, you know, I had my three children at that time. <clears throat> well, you don't have to worry about that uh, because, uh, you know, Jesus said, uh, I believe in Luke 20, you know, that there is no marriage in heaven. So you don't have to worry about being pregnant, ladies, but you'll be in the prime of your youth. Gordon Fee, great New Testament scholar, says, Our present vision of God, as great as it is, is as nothing when compared to the real thing that is yet to be. It is like the difference between seeing a reflected mirror and seeing a person face to face. I guess in modern times, we'd be saying like, it'd be like seeing someone over Zoom compared to face to face right there in front of you. So we're going to see God face to face. Heaven is glorious because it's a place of indescribable beauty. God's glory radiates throughout the entire realm of heaven. So since his glory radiates throughout the land, it's a place of just indescribable beauty. It's a place of incredible beauty. Romans 8 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy of comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. And it's also a place of incredible beauty. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived, but God is prepared for those who have loved him. And heaven is a place where there is no darkness. It's a place of eternal light because Revelation 21 says, There's no need for sun or moon, for the glory of God radiates throughout heaven day and night. It says the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine 
on it for the glory of God gives it its light and the lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. So there's no need for the sun or the moon because the glory of God radiates throughout heaven. So you couple that with the fact that John describes heaven as the most, you know, the heavenly city as the most beautiful things he's ever seen. Streets of gold, uh, gates of pearl, the foundations of the 12 uh, foundations are of the most beautiful, precious stones we have on this earth. Uh, the glory of God, the throne, the crystal sea, the river of life, you know, all of that, the glory of God radiating on that it must just be something absolutely spectacular. You know, I think of the city of Seattle, right? Everyone told me, Seattle, oh, it's the Emerald City, the Emerald City. Sorry, all of you from Seattle there. But I remember when I first got there, it was raining all the time. You know, and the clouds were low. It's like the cloud. I've never seen clouds, rainy clouds so low. It's like right on top of your head. I can see why people drink a lot of coffee there. I see why Starbucks started there. Because, man, it was depressing. And I said, Who, whoever called this the Emerald City? This is the gray city. This is the blah city. You know, but one day, the sun came out. And when the sun radiated on that city, you know, I think uh, we were on a, a mountain overlooking the city and uh, it just so happened we caught it at the right time and wow, it was the Emerald City, you know, green like I had not seen green before. It's a magnificent city when the sun was shining upon it. And then I understood why they called it the Emerald City. So imagine the city of God, the new Jerusalem made of streets of gold and the river of life with water like crystal glass and the throne of God and uh, gates of pearl and, all, and the glory of God shining on all of that. It really must be something spectacular. And John talks about, you know, he, you can read through Revelation, a description of the heavenly city. He says that uh, from its foundation to its walls, the city is made of what appears to be every precious stone imaginable. Even the streets of the city, he writes, are of pure gold like transparent glass. So this heavenly city is made of every precious stone refined as smooth as glass. It must really be something dazzling and you know, glowing when God's glory radiates upon this magnificent city. And heaven, uh, and, and it talks about 12 gates made of pearl, streets of pure gold as transparent as glass. It's got to be something magnificent. And there's no sin in heaven. It's not contaminated by any effects of sin. No death, no deterioration. No imperfection. You're not going to see condos over there collapsing or anything like that. And Jesus, when he talked about heaven, said, In my Father's house are many rooms. I go there to prepare a place for you. You know, I have this castle here, this 30-room castle in Hungary. Because, you know... Uh, Word of Life invited me to come speak in Hungary. And I didn't want to go to Hungary. What, what's a guy in Hawaii want to go to Hungary for? You know, uh, especially they wanted me to speak in February, in the dead of winter. You know, and I said, I ain't going to Hungary. You're crazy. You know, but they said, Pat, Pat, you got to go to this one. You got to go at least once. I said, why? Why do I want to go there? And they said, because the school there bought a 30-room castle. It's like a 400-year-old castle that... They renovated and turned into the Bible Institute there. It's just a magnificent castle. And you got to go check it out and see it because you get to teach in there and you get the guest room in that huge, huge mansion. So I thought, well, OK, that might be worth seeing. And I remember we got there to uh, Hungary there and got to the uh, airport and, you know, made that uh, two hour drive uh, to the 
Bible Institute there. And as I pulled in the driveway, this is what I saw. Just the shining roof and that 30-room castle was just absolutely magnificent. They said, Pat, when you come, we have prepared for you the guest room. And you're really going to love it. And I went up the magnificent wooden stairs. And there was my guest room on the right, a magnificent guest room where I, I'm guessing royalty probably stayed. You know, and Jesus says, in my father's house are many rooms, my father's mansion, many rooms. And I go there to prepare a place for you. Imagine from all eternity, God's eternal mansion. And Christ has prepared a room for you. Imagine that, what kind of room that is going to be. So heaven is going to be a place of glory. Heaven is going to be a place of unending joy. It's a place of unending joy, unending peace and rest. God is the source of joy and we will know his joy because we are in his direct and very intimate presence. You know, uh, because we're in the presence of God, sin and it, its effects will be no more. Heaven is the place where there's no more curse and the effects of the fall will be no more. Romans 8 states that the creation was subjected to frustration to its own choice, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought forth into the glorious freedom of the children of God. You know, sin has affected not only creation, but our relationships as well. And in heaven, we're going to experience an intimacy with God that will transform us to be like him. And our understanding will be transformed for we will see and comprehend things more clearly as we gain his perspective. And as a result of this transformation, our relationships will be harmonious and free from the hindrances that affect us because of our fallen state right now. There's going to be no more curse. It's going to be overcome. Revelation 22 says, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. So the effects of sin will no longer affect us. No death, no sorrow, no pain from the, tr uh, we'll be free from the trials and tribulations of this fallen world. Heaven is a place where there is no sickness. You know, talk about COVID now and the Delta mutation and the Lambda variant and all that. Well, won't be any of that anymore. And many of us who have had to watch our parents and loved ones deteriorate physically, well, they'll be in their full glory and there'll be no sickness anymore. Be no, no sorrow there there'll be no death death will be conquered first corinthians 15 right paul says death where's your sting or grave where's your victory well victory is in christ jesus death has lost its sting there is abundance and fullness of life because god is the very source of life jesus said i am the way the truth and the life is the very source of life and will be there in his presence it's a place of overwhelming joy and a place of eternal rest. That doesn't mean just going to be lying in a hammock all day, eating fruits and drinking wine. Rest meaning rest from your struggle against sin, from against the, uh, the, the enemy, Satan, and the forces of darkness and rest from the world that is right now in the prison house of the enemy and sin. Rest from that. But we're going to be doing a lot in heaven. What will we be doing? Well, I don't know fully what we'll be doing, you know, but here's some of the things that the scripture says we're going to do. We're going to see the Lord face to face. And what a time of communion and 
joy that will be to be with him face to face in full glory. There's going to be a grand reunion of all the saints. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 speaks of the time when we will be caught up with him in the clouds and forever we will be with the Lord. You know, living here in Hawaii, and I'm sure you know, you as well, but maybe we feel a little more in Hawaii because so many people leave Hawaii, you know, to find jobs and affordable living. Um, and so we have to say goodbye a lot. And a lot of my friends, I know that I'm not going to see them for a long time. And sometimes, you know, I don't get to see them when they, you know, go to their new address there. Um, but to know that you know, we're not, we never, as Christians, we never say goodbye, right? Only see you later, because we're going to have a great reunion there. And, you know, when people come back home to Hawaii, or I get to see them somewhere in this world, it's a great reunion that we have. But our reunion in heaven, we never have to say goodbye. We're going to be worshiping the Lord there. We're going to be serving with Christ, Revelation 22 verse 3 says we rule and reign with Christ. So we'll be ruling with Christ over his creation. There'll be the great uh, wedding feast of the Lamb. And there we will receive our eternal reward as well. Now, we could do a whole sermon on eternal rewards. I do a whole series on eternal rewards. So let me just sum it up very briefly what is your reward? Well, praise from God. Well done, good and faithful servant. There'll be no more joyous words to hear from the people of God than to hear their Lord, who they serve their life, say, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, when you receive praise from someone you really admire and respect, well, you're going to get that from the Lord and you get to have that with you for all eternity. Position, you're going to rule and reign with Christ and uh, the responsibility that you will be entrusted with depends on the faithfulness of how you served here upon this earth. And then the prize, eternal rewards that you'll have with you. You know, one of the things I say is that heaven is, is not a social estate. We're not all going to be uh, equal in rewards. There will be those who have greater rewards than others. Those who have served Christ faithfully will have greater rewards. And Paul mentions some of those. He talks about the crown, the crowns that many will receive. And there's about five or six mentioned in the New Testament, the imperishable crown, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of glory that you will receive. And it's a Stephanos crown, all right? The Stephanos crown is the wreath, the gold wreath that you receive for the victor of the Olympic Games, all right? So it's a victory crown given to victors who have won in the battle of life, the people of God who have looked forward to his coming, receive those Stephanos crowns. And some will receive more than others. So <clears throat> that's a little bit, just a brief overview of what's to come in our new address there. And remember, we're going to spend a whole lot more time on the other side of eternity than upon this earth. You know, think about a line. I think you're in California. So a line going from Mexico all the way up to Canada, going right through where you're sitting. All right. And <clears throat> place your finger right on that line that's going from Mexico, intersects your finger and goes all the way to Canada. All right, how long is that line? Well, it's hundreds of miles. How wide is your finger? An inch, <laughs> maybe a little bit more. Well, that your finger on that line represents your lifespan compared to the line of eternity. It's really, really brief. All right. So in other words, since heaven is your eternal home and it's a glorious future for all believers in Christ, and we're going to spend a whole lot more time 
on the other side of eternity's door than here. We want to live wisely for the things that truly matter, right? The things that matter for eternity. And understanding heaven gives us the strength to live with joy and endure even the toughest of times that we face here upon this earth. That's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That is the bodies of those who have died will be resurrected to glory to meet their soul, okay, which is already in heaven, awaiting the resurrection of the body. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, Paul says, encourage one another with these words. The hope of heaven is the greatest hope anyone can have. It's the greatest words of hope and encouragement that can be given to any person. And Paul says, the, this is the hope. These are the words that you are to give to encourage one another. <clears throat> well, I hope this message has blessed you and i hope that joy and the hope of heaven has really inspired you to live for christ and to live for the things of eternity in greater ways than ever before so from hawaii i say god bless you and aloha